Dr. Matthew Hike is an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Studies at New York University. He received his PhD in Environmental Science and Engineering from Harvard University. He was also a postdoctoral science and policy researcher at Harvard Law School in the Animal Law and Policy Program. His current project analyzes the land use requirements of food production more broadly, examining regional and global opportunities for reforestation and negative carbon emissions entailed by shifting toward more efficient consumption patterns and production systems. And today, Dr. Hayek will share some of his findings with us because our topics on had been on the soil, uh, sustainable agriculture, and we'll continue to talk about this moving towards climate change. So his research entails many of these topics. Hi, folks. Um, and Anna, can you remind me how long I have for like presentation and Q&A? So we have like 55 minutes. OK, so until great. 11.45 your time. All right, so uh, I think I think the slides that I've picked are pretty good because they go into some de technical detail with respect to my own work, but don't take a super deep dive. So I'm going to try to get through this stuff, um, give you all a good bird's eye view about the types of questions that I like asking, the um, you know what, what I've worked on in the recent past, so we can leave as much time afterwards for Q and A. With that, let me go ahead and share my screen. So. Today, mostly what I'm going to be talking about is reducing emissions through food choices. And why we're talking about food choices when that might seem a little, you know, wishy-washy or, you know, don't pollute individual when really what we're concerned about in a university research context are big system-wide decisions that happen at scales that are relevant to entire countries and the planet. Um, so hopefully what I can do is do a little bit more to connect the individual food choices we make to the larger systems that we're a part of, both the earth system and the institutions, whether it's a university or a workplace or a hometown that we're all also a part of. So to go back a little bit, my research journey, as Anna mentioned, was coming from a PhD in environmental engineering where I got the privilege of working at this site in the Eastern Amazon rainforest in Pará, in the state of uh, the state of Pará in Brazil, at the confluence of the Tapajós and Amazon rivers in a large state park that was about the size of the state of Delaware. And while I was there, I climbed up this, this 200 foot tall tower um, that was about as skinny as me at the time, um, here as a you know 27 year old researcher, where we measured greenhouse gases, including CO2, which are exchanged between the atmosphere, the the ecosystem of the Amazon rainforest, the processes in the leaves in that canopy, and the overlying atmosphere. And we were doing that to understand the potential vulnerability or resiliency of that forest and its carbon exchanging processes if climate change made droughts happen in 30 to 100 years time due to um, changes in pattern of precipitation and, uh, and temperature. The reason that was interesting is if you look at this map, um, despite the fact that you know, this is all the Amazon rainforest, this site only received two meters, that is about six feet of rainfall per year, making it actually a relatively dry forest. Whereas some locations can receive three to almost four meters of rainfall, making them much wetter. Um, and so this was a good kind of natural or living experiment to do these, to ask the types of questions that we were interested. And as I mentioned, it was at the confluence of the Amazon River just off screen here and the Tapajos, where we worked in this large national forest that was about the size of Delaware. However, when we drove in from Santarém, the nearest town, into the, our research site, which was around here, all on the right and all around were these large swaths of, of fields and smoldering, recently de deforested patches of bare earth. Um, and what I thought was happening there was that they were removing uh, timber and, and clearing that land for timber because I would see an occasional truck with big logs of mahogany hanging off the back of it. 
Um, and that's the typical story that we get about the tropics, right? Like in Fern Gully and different movies and, and Avatar and different movies about deforestation. It's the loggers, it's industry. Well, it turns out in this area, as most of the Amazon, the vast overwhelming majority of this was clearing land to make way for cheap beef because cattle require far more land per unit, calorie, protein, amount of food, what have you, than almost any other animal or food crop. Um, so because of these last of man use, use requirements and because putting cattle on land after deforesting it is a convenient way to kind of claim that land for yourself in the frontier of the Amazon forest, there was this massive deforestation occurring. So while I was doing experiments to research the impacts of climate change in 50 to 100 years time, it was disappearing across the street from me yesterday. And that's really where I shifted to having a focus on food systems. Um, realizing that uh, while the scientific questions that I was working on were incredibly interesting and important, that's not where my passion and my sense of urgency necessarily lie. So I shifted in my postdoc in my science and policy position at the Harvard Law School to focusing predominantly on using my environmental engineering and biogeochemistry skill set to focus on emissions from the food system rather than uh, emissions in exchange in old growth um, kind of uh, uh, untouched ecosystems. So in the first part of this talk, I'm going to describe, be describing the carbon footprint and the greenhouse gas emissions and some other environmental impacts of food. And in the second, I'm going to talk about some scalable solutions that we can all do to have an impact ourselves, but also as part of the larger institutions and social systems that we're all a part of. So bird's eye view perspective, zooming way out from the Amazon and looking at global climate change, global food systems contribute 21 to 37 percent of greenhouse gas emissions, approximately a third. So that's not only emissions that are coming from the farms themselves, like the fertilizers that grow on crops and the belches from cattle, that's, that's emissions that come from land clearing before those farms are even established, like the deforestation in Brazil, um, CO2 emissions when forests are burned. And it's also, uh, you know, fossil fuel in trucks that are being, that are shipping food. It's also the methane that our food emits after it ends up in a landfill and decomposes over year, years and emits methane because there's not that much, much oxygen in that environment. So all throughout the food system, about a third of global emissions, making these emissions incredibly important to tackle. And if we look at where those are, uh, this is a study that pegged food systems at about a quarter. Again, there's, di there's differences. It's a wide range and different studies have different amounts. Different studies have also different boundaries around what they consider the food system. So this study, for instance, didn't consider the waste from landfills producing methane. It stopped at the retailer and the consumer. But it gives us a good broad perspective on what our emissions are in the food system. And here you can see that despite all of the you know, dirty trucks that are being used in our food system, like somebody was talking earlier about that air gas truck belching smog, um, we think of trucks and transport and packaging and factories as causing most of the pollution, which it does in much of our economy. But within the food system, it's actually a relatively small amount of food's emissions. And globally, transportation emissions are only about 6% of any food's products. So what this means is that transportation is a small fraction of almost any food's climate impacts. And what we eat matters far more than how far away it was produced. As you can see here directly, livestock and fisheries produce almost a third of our food system's emissions. And the crops that we grow for animal feed produce a lot of emissions. And the land we clear for livestock produces a lot of emissions. So a lot of this is coming directly from animals or the processes that we're, we're doing to make more feed and land for those animals. And you can see that here in a chart that has lots of different transportation, uh, farm, land use change processing, which are different colors of each bar for every individual food product uh, normalized by kilogram of food product um, for, for many different food commodities. And what you can, you know, I've heard a lot about how bad it is to eat bananas because they're shipped all the way from uh, Ecuador and Honduras. And there are certainly big social concerns with the um, exploited labor on banana farms. But the greenhouse gas emissions coming from all that transportation, it's not really that significant when you consider 
how efficient international shipping has gotten. So taking a look at bananas here, um, the transportation is almost half of bananas total greenhouse gas footprint, which is not insignificant. But you compare that to a pork chop, and it's 10 times lower. And you compare that pork chop to beef, and it's, you know, 70 times lower. So what this means is that a banana shipped all the way from Honduras to New York City or Louisiana um, still has about 70 times less of a carbon footprint than a local um, sirloin steak. And it goes to show that our food choices really do matter, both what we purchase, what we choose to eat, and whether we throw it out. And this is why Project Drawdown, that every year lists the top 100 solutions to climate change per the amount of gigatons of CO2 equivalent greenhouse gas, those changes could potentially reduce uh, every year, reducing food waste that is throwing out less food and eating more plants and fewer animal products are some of the best things that can, we can do globally to reduce uh, our total greenhouse gas em emissions. Um, they make the top 10 every year, and they're the best things that we can do in our food system to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by the amount of gigatons that it could potentially mitigate. Some other interesting things on here, educating girls and family planning. These are good to do and to invest in in their own right, but they also have this fringe benefit of um, when you give, when you educate girls and you give women the access and resources for family planning, uh, they often choose to have smaller families and invest more of their time and effort in, um, in uh, providing for themselves in education, in uh, you know, doing the things that we consider more, uh, 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 you know, to be more uh, long-term, um, uh, kind of wellness building for folks that are increasingly living in urban settings and as we shift from an agrarian to an urban society. So as I described earlier, food systems contribute about a third of global emissions and farmed animals and their resource needs contribute at least 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions. That is about half to 70% of food system emissions, despite the fact that animals only contribute about less than one fifth of global calories and one third of global protein. So the resource needs and emissions of farmed animals outstrip the amount to which they provide for food security in globally. However, in particular regions, animals and livestock can be very important to food security and one third of all food is wasted. And it turns out these problems are far more interrelated than we actually believed at first because about 44% of all of the edible food in the world are fed directly to animals. So why is it that so much edible food is being used to produce livestock? It all has to do with the concept of ecological efficiency or trophic efficiency. That is any time you, you know, when I'm just sitting around my apartment or, you know, watching Netflix or grading papers without getting any physical exercise, I am burning through almost 2000 calories a day. So I need food just to exist, let alone exercise or put on weight. And because those needs are so high just to maintain current metabolism, it takes about nine calories of grain to produce one calorie of chicken meaning that every time I throw out a chicken, you know, a chicken breast, it's essentially the equivalent to throwing out nine plates of spaghetti. So animal products have a lot of embedded calories and a lot of embedded waste and um, resource needs and use. However, grazing our cattle, which can eat grass, they don't necessarily need, you know, grain feed on a uh, Grazing them on grass might be a good alternative to improving food security, but there are some interesting and hidden trade-offs. A colleague of mine and I ran a model where we uh, modeled turning all of the USA's feedlot raised beef, which we currently feed at the end of their lives on grain like soy, soy and corn, over to grass. And we found that doing so would actually lead to needing 30% more cattle. Because when you finish cows on grass, um, and feed them entirely on grass, they can't actually gain as much weight and reach lower overall slaughter weights. 
Those cows, meanwhile, would be belching 43% more methane as they chew through and the bacteria anaerobically ferment and digest all of that additional gruff cellulose that we humans can't digest from grass and would require 200 uh, 70 percent more land. So the land use requirements would go up almost fourfold. That would be 270 percent in addition to what they use now. Um, so essentially we couldn't have entirely grass-fed beef without annexing Canada and Mexico unless we drastically reduce consumption. And uh, regenerative grazing is making a lot of headlines and one farm even got a lot of press two years ago by claiming that they were carbon negative. That is, that farm was said they were grazing cattle so well that they were sequestering more CO2 in the soil than methane, nitrous oxide, and other emissions that their animals were belching and pooping into the atmosphere. So this ranch was advertised as carbon negative, but recent peer review findings, that is Rowan, Tweet, Rowan Tree et al. 2020 in Frontiers and Sustainable Food Systems, actually found that this ranch that was advertising itself as carbon negative was actually a net source of carbon. They, underestimate, they underestimated their animals emissions and they overestimated the soil carbon sink. So soils carbon, soil carbon sequestration offset enough greenhouse gas emissions to make the system reduce net emissions by two thirds relative to that of conventional meat. And that's nothing to sneeze at, right? That carbon sequestration did a lot of work um, offsetting those greenhouse gas emissions. However, that offset is likely not permanent as the soil, uh, the amount of carbon that the soil can hold is a bit like a sponge and it saturates over time, just like a sponge can only soak up so much water. I'm speaking in very broad terms that Anna would probably, um, you know, slap me on the wrist for, but we do notice soil carbon saturation effects across a variety of ecosystems, although we're not always sure what that saturation point is. So that offset is likely not permanent. And the amount of animal greenhouse gases that the animals were belching and coming from their manure was actually larger in this system. So more emissions means the soil needs to do more work to sequester in order to kind of come out to be net neutral or not as bad as conventional meat production. And very importantly, this system actually required 2.5 times the land of conventional meat. This was one particular ranch in Georgia so we're not looking at the entire country, but on rough terms, this is roughly um, the same kind of order that we got from our results when we modeled a shift towards grass-fed beef. So um, what we see across the board is higher land use requirements from grass-fed, regenerative, and holistically managed systems. Therefore, reduction in consumption needs to happen if we wanna eat better meat. Because if we don't reduce our consumption, but we shift to these so-called regenerative uh, methods, we would actually need to deforest and clear more land in order to make room for all of that sustainable food. It means that better production and more sustainable consumption needs to go hand in hand. So um, what have I contributed to some of this research on the note of land use requirements? Well, as we discussed, farmed animals emit greenhouse gases and also use a lot of land for grazing, even more land if we're gonna graze them more exclusively than feed them feed crops, which we also feed them. And as we discussed, if we eat mostly plants, we can grow everything we need using far less land. And I haven't gone into the exact statistics, but it's about globally, we would need about, uh, we could cut our land use in about a quarter by eating far more plant rich diets. So not by a quarter, rather, we could cut our land use by three quarters, that is, we're using four times more land than we would need if we all ate predominantly plants. Um, and with that remaining land, we could rewild native ecosystems, which would in turn suck CO2 up out of the atmosphere. So what did my colleagues and I do? We actually modeled this. By the way, that would also provide the fringe benefit for a lot of additional habitat and biodiversity conservation. Um, especially in tropical forests, but even in temperate forests like here in the Northeast where we could have more black bears or you know, badgers and um, beavers and things that really live in this native forested ecosystem were it not for a number of farms and suburbs in this region. So we actually modeled this globally. 
And we found that animal production competes with carbon sequestration, not only around the perimeter of the Amazon rainforest, which we expect, and um, in parts of the Congo and Southeast China, which are kind of tropical ecosystems, right? The Philippines, other places elsewhere, Indonesia, we found, but here in green, we actually also found a massive uh, carbon opportunity cost or potential to rewild native ecosystems and suck carbon out of the atmosphere in lands that are currently being used for animal production. In the Eastern United States, in the Pacific Northwest and all over large swaths of Europe from Russia to the UK and Ireland. Um, and we were able to model these scenarios through 2050 where we found that business as usual, if we keep eating as much meat and as developing countries eat more and more meat, um, that would actually create more net emissions to the atmosphere. But if we ate Eat Lancet style diets, these are dietary recommendations that ask Americans to reduce red meat consumption by um, by uh, four fifths or vegan diets that were all, you know, the hypothetical extreme where none of us ate meat anymore, which we are not advocating more, but we did want to look at that extreme possibility. Um, then we find that both of these scenarios would actually sequester massive amounts of carbon back into the land on that land we no longer needed for all of that additional grazing and feed crop production. And we were able to find that dietary changes could se technically sequester the past nine to 16 years of fossil fuel emissions back into natural ecosystems. And importantly, most of this could happen in high income countries and upper middle income countries so that we're not talking about, you know, um, low and lower middle income countries, which are predominantly in areas like um, Central and Southern Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. We wouldn't have to kind of talk about taking you know, the livelihoods and the smallholder agrarian grazing farming away, um, you know, cattle or goat farming away from any anyone in those regions. And a lot of the past 10 years of these emissions regions could be offset through shifts towards more plant production and consumption. So with that, I now want to go on to talking about what does any of this mean in practice, right? Like this is all great that we could all eat less meat and you know, land, more land would be available to act as a carbon sponge. Um, that's all well and good, but how do we actually scale some of these changes in consumer choices, which will ripple, ripple through international commodity markets globally to what we can do ourselves and at our local and community levels all the way up to the global scale? Well, first of all, things that you can think of is just being plant forward and being more diverse in the ways that you eat, right? So if you're comfortable with, uh, you know, a meat and potatoes diet that is like, you know, like some starch, a giant chunk of meat, and maybe a little vegetable on your plate, think about reversing that and eating mostly vegetables with, you know, three or four ounces of skirt steak or, you know, trying out a grain and salad bowl or, um, you know, even less kind of, you know, uh, a humdrum than that would be, find what options are available in your city kind of outside of a you know, typical diet that you yourself would be eating. I'm very lucky to be in New York City. So I can eat um, you know, uh, sundaes made out of purple sweet potato uh, and coconut ice cream. Uh, we have a, a bakery here that creates entirely plant-based pastry without any dairy in it that is indistinguishable from its French, you know, butter and milk rich counterpart. So here is a Milfoy pastry from a bakery in New York City um, and some hand pulled uh, spicy noodles at a Chinese um, uh, hand pulled noodle stand in Chelsea Market. And so, you know, all of these might be how you're used to eating. They might be totally outside the realm of, you know, eating that you're comfortable with. Um, but importantly, there are always options to try outside of what you're familiar with, which might be a meat and potatoes diet. And when you explore options in your city, you can find new ways of eating, you know, vegetables at a Thai restaurant that you might not have, you know, with noodles that you might not have been familiar with previously. And in pretty much every state and city of the country, I have found amazing options to explore um, that aren't kind of reliant on you know, tons of beef and pork. We can also use technology to reconceptualize the way that we produce food using a combination of the old and new. 
cover cropping has been seen as a way to um, improve soil erosion when the crops aren't growing and the soils are bare to make sure that there's always some type of growth that you know erosion does that that rainfall doesn't strip the, the soil away from the soil with um, and we can also think about combining that with new technologies for instance technologies in ai monitoring and harvesting um, that can reform some of the really awful labor practices that we have in agriculture currently and just like we can use old and new in production, we can also use old and new in consumption. So right now there are actually technologies to uh, make burgers and cuts of meat out of whole animal cells in ways that don't require killing an animal, but rather in the same that we same way that we can now, um, you know, grow tissues for medical procedures if you need part of your skin replaced, or if you need to heal a hole in your heart, we can now replicate meat out of, entirely out of animal cells. And a lot of this technology is on the horizon. And while this may sound disgusting to some, I can guarantee you it pales in comparison to what's happening inside closed doors on the indoor farms that we produce the vast majority of our animals inside of, where massive amounts of manure are being, yeah, animals are walking around in massive amounts of manure and they're being fed massive amounts of antibiotics not to get sick living in those conditions, which in the meanwhile is make, adding and contributing to a lot of public health risks. At the same time, as our food trade globalizes, so are our food cultures. And I think it behooves a lot of us to realize how tra traditional food cultures have been eating and using um, mostly plants to produce very delicious cuisine for centuries and millennia. So here is a picture in uh, Melbourne, Australia of a family sharing a traditional Senegalese meal, which is not entirely vegan, but again, the amounts of plants and, and different plant stews made out of things like spicy lentils and stewed cabbage and different grains um, like millet are very prominent in this dish that uses a lot of spices to make them interesting and, and, uh, and to taste great and a little bit of meat and dairy to kind of supplement the flavors of the plants in that meal. We can also think about changing the default options. So rather than every event that you're going at your university when we're all back in person and there's um, you know, a few different sandwiches at your department event um, or there's you know, a catered lunch somewhere uh, where there's a ham sandwich, a chicken sandwich, and then maybe a tofu wrap, reverse that and have the first options that we pick, our default options, be the falafel, be the hummus sandwich. And you can provide just as many choices for there to be a roast beef and a chicken sandwich, but you, if you want that option, it's further down the line and you have to request it specifically. By that way, we can um, not reduce the amount of choices that people have overall, but make it the more socially accepted and encouraged thing to pick that plant forward option first. New York City is also doing a lot to scale local actions globally. We've initiated Meatless Monday in NYC schools from fall of 2019 with an emphasis on replacing meat options with plant options. And there has been high student acceptance of these meals. They are just as healthy as the meat meals and students are throwing just as much or little of it away as they used to, if not throwing away less. Uh, Bill de Blasio, also our mayor, also made a fantastic comment with this initiative where he specifically addressed the greenhouse gas and climate change implications of this plan. Cutting back on meat a little will improve New Yorkers' health and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Hence, as part of our city's Green New Deal, as part of our plans to build a more resilient and climate-friendly city, we are going to be reducing the city's red meat purchases in all of its schools, hospitals, et cetera, by 50% by the year 2050 and phasing out the purchasing of all processed meat which is a type one carcinogen as classified by the World Health Organization. And that processed meat contributes to the risk of colorectal cancer the more you eat it over time. We can also have more science-based guidelines, which we don't have in the United States. Industry gets input in our dietary guidelines. Canada, that has been the case as well for years, but they have now kicked the food industry and the meat and dairy industry, the sugar industry, the snack and beverage industry out of their dietary guideline process. And it is now made only by scientists, which is what we need. 
And when Canada did this, they introduced a mostly plant-based plate where, where the only things that you don't have as plants are in the protein section. And that's great because there can be some salmon, some low fat, high protein yogurt, some eggs, some chicken, some beef in there. And that's all a great diet and it's perfectly healthy. But what this plate highlights is that if you want to, you can also substitute that with seeds, nuts, legumes, lentils, chickpeas, you know, hummus and falafel, uh, plant-based cheeses, and all of them will be just as healthy. So it doesn't matter where you get your protein from in order to get protein. There's no such thing as low quality protein. But we wanna make sure that when we're consuming that protein, we're not consuming too much saturated fat and cholesterol along with it, which are abundant in spades in certain animal products. There's also water instead of milk. The idea that we should be drinking three glasses of, day, of milk a day is entirely industry-based. There is no scientific basis of that recommendation in the United States, and it does not help with bone calcium because calcium is in plenty of foods, including abundantly in dark leafy greens and many different plant foods. And to eat, just like in the United States has been more recently suggesting, far more whole grains, things like wild rice, whole wheat bread, quinoa and brown rice, um, whole wheat pasta, rather than refined grains like Wonder Bread and Doritos. And even though Canada didn't have a low emissions, you know, guideline or sustainability guideline as part of their dietary guidelines, this plate of food happens to be way more climate friendly than the current average American diet. So there are all of these fringe benefits of eating more sustainably and healthy. They tend to go hand in hand when we eat more plant-based and healthier. And lastly, the last thing that I'm going to mention is that there has been a lot of talk about divesting from fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are the biggest contribution in terms of the electricity we generate and the cars we drive and the, um, and the manufacturing that we do. All of the gas and oil and coal that we use to power those processes is the biggest contribution to climate change. Uh, agriculture is definitely in second place but we need to address both. We need to address both fossil fuels and emissions from the food system. And just as we've been calling for big corporations, universities, and pension funds to divest from fossil fuels, I believe that animal agriculture is going to be the next frontier for asking folks to divest from their portfolios because it's a massive, um, it causes massive environmental harm and it is a massive risk to invest in that at this stage. Of, of our society um, because of the amount of potential environmental harm that animal agriculture causes. And we need more countries to include reductions in waste and reductions in meat and dairy consumption in their nationally determined contributions to the Paris Agreement. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and thank you